Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is James Gethin Evans, and uh, today with my uh, co-conspirator Nargis Casanova, uh, we're very excited to welcome you to the discussion on contesting territory, asserting sovereignty beyond China's borders, uh, co-sponsored by the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies and the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University. Um, today, we have three fantastic speakers who are each bringing uh, their own opinions and their own perspectives on China's outbound activities in the South China Sea, uh, the Indian Ocean, and beyond. Our first speaker is Andrew Chubb. He's a senior lecturer in Chinese politics and international relations at the Department of Politics, Philosophy, and Religion at Lancaster University. He's the author of Chinese Nationalism and the Grey Zone, uh, which is from the Naval War College Press, published in 2021, uh, and PRC Overseas Political Activities, published with Routledge in 2021, um, as well as a recent article in International Security uh, that gives a glimpse into what he will be discussing today. Uh, Darshana Ambarua is a fellow with the South Asia Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she directs the Indian Ocean Initiative. Her work examines the impact of maritime security in foreign policy engagements in the Indo-Pacific, with a focus on India and China's outbound strategies and partnerships, as well as the island agencies that shape power competition. Uh, she has a forthcoming book on the Indian Ocean in the 21st century uh, that will hopefully be coming out very shortly with Yale University Press. Isaac B. Carden is a senior fellow for China Studies in the Asia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, where he researches China's maritime affairs and PRC foreign and security policy. Uh, his new book is on China's law of the sea uh, with Yale University Press uh, out this year, um, which analyzes the extent to which China is making the rules in regional and global orders. And he also has a recent article in International Security published with Wendy Leutert, which will form a topic for today's discussion. Um, so to start, uh, we will have Andrew Chubb uh, talking about his research. And afterwards, uh, after our three speakers have finished, uh, we will pivot to a Q&A, uh, including Q&A with the audience. So I encourage you to submit questions via the, the Q&A chat box um, or via the comment section on YouTube. Um, so to start with, uh, Andrew Chubb. Thanks, James. Um, and thanks also, Nargis, for all your hard work in organizing. Thanks to everyone at the Davis Center and the Fairbank Center for putting together a really great panel. Um, Dashana and Isaac are two people that I've constantly learned from over the years. So it's uh, it's it's really an honor to share a panel with them. Um, congratulations to both of you also on your uh, published or forthcoming books. Um, my, I think James might have referred to it as a book, but uh, more of a monograph, um, actually only came out with Isaac's expert help when he was at the Naval War College. Um, so so that's uh, that's quite appropriate too. Um, so I just want to make three quick points in relation to this question of uh, China's territorial assertiveness, in particular in relation to the maritime domain. Um, number one point, I think needs needs to be sort of teased out is what is assertiveness? So it's really important, I think we the discourse around this topic um, largely revolves around this term assertiveness. but it's it's very important to break down what we think assertiveness actually means in this context of territorial and maritime disputes. Um, we can argue over what the definition should be. Uh, the definition that I put forward in some of the things that I've put out there, is changes in behavior that advance the state's position in the dispute. Um, again, arguments, um, there, there are various uh, upsides and downsides of such a definition, um, but the upside is, is mainly that it, it renders it measurable, what assertiveness actually is. It's changes in behavior. Um, and it renders measurable, you know, something that is actually manageable. Because if we were trying to measure every move that was made in the dispute, every action that a state takes every action that every state takes in, in a dispute, it would just be unmanageably large because there's things going on every day in a lot of disputes. So it's putting the focus on changes in behavior over a given time period. Um, the other advantage of that definition is that enables it, uh, you to break it down into 
different types of assertive moves. So there's four very distinct assertive uh, types of behavior that, that I've identified in those uh, pieces that James mentioned, and also in this uh, report published last year with the National Bureau of Asian Research. Declarative, so basically that's your uh, public statements, um, verbal assertions of ownership over the disputed territory. Demonstrative, where you go in there unilaterally and increase your presence or administer the, dis the disputed possession without confronting your adversaries. Coercion, where you do confront your adversaries with the threat or use of punishment and the use of force, so directly seizing the disputed possession. Um, so the bottom line there is um, with a rigorous definition, uh, assertiveness actually can be measured in a, in a systematic way. Um, and then I just want to share a, a few um, functions of the website that the National Bureau of Asian Research has put together on the basis of the data um, that, uh, that, that that definition has enabled. Uh, I'll try and share my screen. And that's the one, isn't it? Is that showing a web browser now? Yeah, that looks great. Okay. Um, so uh, where are we? Yeah, there's a couple of tabs in there, right? Okay, so um, the findings from that from that research, uh, very briefly, uh, the new report that came out last year compares China's assertive moves, that is its changes in behavior over time, with the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, it's called Dynamics of Assertiveness in the South China Sea. Um, and what that really shows is that China's push on its maritime periphery started in the South China Sea a lot earlier than most people assume. So it's it, it really shows that it's from 2007 and not from 2009. That's important because it means it wasn't a response to the US's sort of uh, diminishment of the US's credibility and power following the financial crisis. And even more importantly, I think for, for current uh, discussions, um, it wasn't Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping came to power in 2012, arguably in 2010, um, but it's pretty hard to make the case that Xi Jinping was really the driving force in 2007. So that means that the South China Sea push is about much more than Xi Jinping. Um, one of the visualizations that the National Bureau of Asian Research uh, has put together sort of shows this fairly clearly. This is just the total number of assertive moves. Um, you might see my mouse uh, skirting around it. This is China's total number of assertive moves from 1970 to 2015. And you see that it's from 2007 that the height of the bars, the number of assertive moves really goes up significantly. And the quality, the, the type of assertiveness changes becomes much more coercive. That's the red bars down here, this block of red bars. Um, at the same time, you can see for the Philippines, um, Philippines quite interestingly had a period where it kind of introduced um, the, the attempt to kind of control uh, parts of the South China Sea using on-water coercion. That's in the 19, sort of from the 1990s and into the early 2000s. Goes away with the Royal Administration and assertiveness comes back under President Aquino, uh, but in a much less coercive form. And then the big picture for Vietnam is that you know they they they're kind of matching China through the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, um, but then from the late 2000s onwards, they really can't match China. And Vietnam's overall number of assertive moves has actually been going down over time as a result. Um, a couple of other quick functionalities to just share with you, um, if I can make these windows work. Okay, so it's got, um, South China Sea is obviously a big place. Um, the There are different parts of the South China Sea that are quite different uh, in terms of the different claimants that are there. Parts of the South China Sea are just disputed bilaterally between Vietnam uh, and China, and other parts are disputed among four or five other claimant states. Um, you've got oil and gas, uh, resources distributed unevenly. You've got fisheries resources in particular parts. And so it's important to break it down. And that's one of the things that this NBR report does. Um, you can access the data visualizations at uh, mavd.nbr.org. I might put that in the chat um, once I've got my keyboard back. Um, I'll just show you a couple of things that, that come out when you click around. Um, this is the paracels. And um, so these mini charts on the right show the number of uh, Chinese assertive moves, you can change to uh, Vietnamese as well. Um, just looking at Chinese assertive moves, you can see that um, the assertiveness from 2007 um, really picks up in the paracels from 2007, um, as well as on Vietnam's continental shelf. 
further to the south, uh, very clear there. And China starts operating in the far southern reaches of the South China Sea at the bottom of the nine dash line. Uh, again, that's more of a long term build up, but definitely a, a stepwise change from 2007. What's interesting is actually in the Spratly Islands, um, the trend is uh, not quite as clear. Um, there's a little bit of an uptick, but it, it wasn't China's push from 2007 seemingly wasn't aimed primarily at the Spratly Islands, the most controversial area um, in the last few years, certainly. Likewise, in the sort of Scarborough Shoal area, which I've called the central eastern part, um, that's that's something that was more of a slow build. It wasn't just about 2012 and the famous Scarborough Shoal incident in which China seized a shoal that was previously uh, controlled by the Philippines. Um, very briefly, uh, uh, trying to look for some indication. I'm, I've lost track of time a little bit. Uh, <laughs> have I got one or two minutes left? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, uh, so just very briefly, um, this map uh, that I'll try and bring up now shows us a dynamic picture over time. Um, this again is at mavd.nbr.org. So I encourage any viewers to go there and explore the data for yourself. Um, offers a dynamic map. You can pause it um, if the uh, amount of information coming at you is too much. Uh, basically, you can see what, what happens over time. It's a longer longer term process back to the 1970s of expansion towards control by the PRC from an initial period of a, a, a sort of position of inferiority, really. Um, if we pause it back in the 1970s, which you can do with this uh, nifty time slider thing, um, if you take, for example, the 1970s, you can see that the PRC is nowhere to be found, really, in the whole, in most of this, the South China Sea. It's starting to get assertive in the Paracel Islands. Then um, this is quite a cool function. You can select a, a sort of given year range. You can expand or contract that as you wish if you're interested in a particular given time period and what was happening in the South China Sea over that time period. Um, you can see in the 1970s, it's, it's about the Southeast Asian countries. Uh, they're not passive at that time. There's a scramble for the Spratleys. Uh, in the 1990s, the Philippines really starts to get involved. And then if you, you select the period from uh, sort of 2007 onwards, you can see the PRC is overwhelmingly the one making the assertive moves uh, from that time forward. Um, so the bottom line, um, have a play around if you're interested uh, in this approach to the study of maritime and territorial disputes, mavd.nbr.org. You can download the report that presents the findings and play around with the data. You can also you can download the raw data and uh, do what do, do what you wish to do in terms of statistical analysis. And uh, hopefully this is an approach that can be applied more broadly. Um, we've got a data set coming up for the East China Sea. Um, I'm hopeful that we can also expand it to include some of the claimants, the other claimants in the South China Sea, Malaysia and Indonesia. Um, and it would be very interesting to see it applied to uh, a land-based dispute, such as the Sino-Indian border disputes along the line of actual control. Um, thanks very much for listening, and I'm uh, really looking forward to learning from my other panelists. Thanks so much, Andrew. And uh, for those of you who know me in the Fairbank Center, we love a good data visualization infographic. So this is very up my alley. Um, okay, next up we have uh, Darshana Burua. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, James, so much and August for uh, for the invitation into the Dave Center and the Fabric Center for this conversation. Wonderful to be here with my colleague Isaac and, and uh, um, Andrew, of course, and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Um, I also do have an interactive map uh, to, to share, I guess. Uh, we are all very invested in maps, which is great. Uh, I thought I'll start with just um, providing a little overview of the Indian Ocean region because uh, different countries define Indian Oceans differently and uh, there are different interpretations of what includes and what is not included. So we build this map specifically aimed at generating more awareness and information on the Indian Ocean. So I'll start with that and get, and after that, I'll, I'll get into the specific question of India and China in the Indian Ocean region. Um, let me just share this. Um, so, it, within the Indian Ocean Initiative, at, at 
at the Carnegie Endowment, we look at the we look at the Indian Ocean region sort of from including the choke points and the and the eastern coast of Africa to the western shores of uh, shores of Australia. And one of the ways one of the reasons why we do that is to really understand the choke points in the region, which are critical for movements and uh, transit as well as deployments. I'm going to turn off the. Um, country name so that we can see the CD choke points. Um, we have an updated map and a second phase of it coming out this summer. So this was the first phase of it. So th there'll definitely be updates and um, improvements on the on the style on the style of it. Um, if you look at we mark three the three main choke points in the Indian Ocean region, the Strait of Hormuz and and this is an interactive map so you can actually click on uh, the points on the map and get a reading on what it with little definitions on it. But the three choke points are Strait of Hormuz, the Babel Mandeb, and of course the one which is very critical and talked in in with reference to China is the Strait of uh, Strait of Malacca. There's also we also identify the Mozambique Channel in the in the Indian Ocean region because it's not a choke point, but it's a channel that becomes the alternate route for movements of goods. Uh, to Europe should something happen in the Red Sea and Suez Canal area, which we saw it happen last year when the Evergreen was stuck there for a couple of um, couple of days. Um, the Indian Ocean region is for a very long time has been divided into continental so silos of either South Asia, Middle East or Africa where the maritime domain somewhere disappeared in that. And to better understand um, how the ocean will have an implication on on countries, on competition, as well as China's behavior in the region, the idea is to really look at it as one, uh, one, uh, one area. We also have um, so on the left is the legend, and um, because this map is available on the uh, Carnegie's website, these are all the countries that we've identified uh, with the littorals and island nations of the Indian Ocean region. And you can, um, can you sorry, can you see that the Sri Lanka pop up? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so you can go in and out of countries and and take a look at what it says. We have little information on that right now. Um, but China is both essentially a, a old and a new player in, in the region um, in a way that, let me actually, sorry, um, let me show you the last aspect that I wanted to do, which was to map the disputes in the Indian Ocean region because we're talking about sovereignty, territorial sovereignty and assertiveness. The, and the conversation in South China Sea is of course very different, but in the Indian Ocean region, China is sort of um, a welcome player because China is also the country with no territorial dispute with anybody else. So China is viewed through a different lens in the way that China is viewed in the South China Sea. Um, China also has great relationship with a lot of the littoral countries, whether it's within the context of um, South Asia, Middle East, or Africa, but I also think that China does put in some um, effort in looking at the region as one given, for example, China is the only country uh, which has an embassy in each of the island nations in the Indian Ocean region, which are six of them. No other country, none of the traditional powers, not India, not UK, not France, um, of course, not United States, who has an um, embassy in all six of the island island uh, nations in the region. One aspect of the territorial um, assertiveness or disputes that I think stands out in the Indian Ocean is the issue of um, Diego Garcia or the, Ch or the Chagos Archipelago, where essentially uh, there's a dispute between, the, there's a territorial dispute between the United Kingdom and Mauritius, and the issue has gone up to the, UN, uh, to the UN at ICJ, and as well as an advisory opinion at the General Assembly. And UK and US uh, initially had refused to uh, acknowledge that acknowledge that ruling or that opinion. And today, um, and that had an impact amongst littorals and nations in the Indian Ocean region who were essentially, um, you know, if you go to the countries in the Indian Ocean region, I said, this is about rules-based international order. At least we follow norms, rules, and the UN framework. And, there were a lot of conversation that pointed out towards the PCA ruling from 2016, Philippines versus China, and China refused to, you know, acknowledge that or said that it doesn't have an impact on impact on the on the sovereign uh, the 
this territorial dispute between, which is a bilateral dispute between China and Philippines. And it's, a, it's sort of a similar stand that United States and United Kingdom took on, on the case with Mauritius. So for a lot of the countries in the region, it essentially is, okay, it's not just China breaking the norms. It's also the, it's also other players breaking the norms. So it's not about one country's adhering or Western powers are adhering to rules and norms better than China is. So the rules-based international order conversation is slightly weaker in the Indian Ocean region on the ba purely basis on territorial disputes. This is not to say that there are not concerns about China in the Indian Ocean or there are not concerns about China's activities or uh, unsustainable debt financing, but this is something uh, that is that does not that is not um, easily accepted by a lot of the islands and littorals because they are far more engaged with the issue of Chagos Archipelago, and it's an issue of decolonization. So it runs a little deeper uh, in terms of territorial disputes than I think uh, a lot in the Indian Ocean region. Um, no, sorry, in the South China Sea. Um, in terms of China in the Indian Ocean region, I think China is one country. Um, who does not necessarily have any political baggage from the past because it, China did not have that sort of a relationship with countries in the countries in the area, and it somewhere and someplace works in favor uh, favor of the uh, government. Um, like I said, China is the only country with an embassy in each of the islands in the Indian Ocean region, some of which date back to the 70s. So you can't necessarily say China is a new player in the Indian Ocean region. China has been an actor in the Indian Ocean region. The aspect that is new is China today can offer offer itself as a credible partner and an actor on the security and political aspects of engagements with countries. That bit is what is new. So when we go and say China's forays into the Indian Ocean is new, of course, in terms of military, I think it's new. But in terms of economic or diplomatic outreach, I think China fares fairly well and, and it um, predates the conversation that has garnered international attention in terms of uh, the South China Sea. Um, on the question of India and China, India is a key player in the Indian Ocean region after somewhere after the Cold War, the ocean somewhere got divided into Eastern Indian Ocean and Western Indian Ocean. France plays a bit prominent role on the Western Indian Ocean and India plays a prominent role on the Eastern Indian Ocean. But China and India has had minimum interactions at sea because of the border tension and the continental disputes between India and China, which has been the focal point for India's defense ministry as well as India's national security priorities. Um, this led to the national security priorities and the defense um, priorities on the plate led to the Indian Navy being uh, the least funded armed service of the Indian Defense Forces. The Navy traditionally gets somewhere between 14 to 15% of the of India's defense budget. And it is tasked with, and its area of responsibility is the entire Indian Ocean region, as you see on this map, map which is a vast area, uh, to be able to actually be present there uh, continuously and to be able to monitor developments and draw trends on what's happening on one side of the Indian Ocean to the other side of the Indian Ocean. Uh, the priorities, of course, lies in the Bay of Bengal and the Eastern Indian Ocean and the Northwest Indian Ocean Persian Gulf. Um, as the conversation and the dispute between India and China have gotten worse on the continental um, side of it, on the Northern Territorial border, there is now more and more discussions on what India can do in the Indian Ocean region uh, in terms of leveraging its strengths and position its home base as the Indian Ocean region. And a lot of the conversation surrounds in terms of the Malacca dilemma being China's trade is dependent on it, it's a small trade, and also the use of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which you know, uh, it, this is the this is the exclusive economic zone of the Andaman group of islands and the Nicobar group of islands. And as you can see, this is we've placed a point for Strait of Malacca here, but then uh, it's very it's sitting right at the mouth of the of the Straits of Malacca. Let me also try and put this. Um, we wanted to map shipping through the Indian Ocean region to better to get a better understanding of of the strategic significance of these islands. Um, this layer is a little heavy, so my take off. So this is based on movement of ships um, across the Indian Ocean region that carried, carrying only um, liquid energy in the year 2021. This does not cover any other movement of tankers or commodities. 
Now, if you look at sort of, if you zoom in and um, look at Andamans, it gives you an idea of the traffic that's coming out of the Straits of Malacca and where the islands are situated. So it's natural that when India talks about its defense priorities and in the ability to disrupt or, or um, impact China's movements into the Indian Ocean region, this is the key area to it. But I think the, but I think the other, other aspect to be uh, mindful of is also Indonesia and where it sits and how much of an impact it, Indonesia would have in the region. Uh, we've also mapped every island territory in the Indian Ocean region, which will, um, this layer is a little heavy, so it takes, uh, some time in zooming in and out. Um, um, there are Australian territories at the bottom um, on the on these two. So it's Cocos Keeling and Christmas Islands, and and I, and I think we are all uh, you know when you when you read about what the Quad is trying to do in terms of deployments, there has been deployments of PAs between Andamans to Darwin or Andamans and Cocos. It's all keeping in mind sort of over overview of the Straits of uh, Straits of Malacca. Um, I'll turn this shipping rooms off. Um, so that's really in terms of uh, what China, uh, in terms of the story that is fan panning out in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, a lot of the countries rely or consider India as the key player in the Indian Ocean region in its competition with, with China. A lot of the islands, whether it's Sri Lanka, Maldives, Mauritius, Seychelles, they, uh, India is a key partner for a lot of them. India has great partnerships in the Middle East with Oman, with, um, of course, has a relationship with Iran, um, as well as on the on the African coast. Um, and but they are also equally uh, equally good with the partnerships with China. So the competition in the Indian Ocean region is is panning out in a way that is not military, but I think more political, economic, and diplomatic in a way in a way that could have military implications. Um, finally, I think I'd say this, that um, a lot of countries in the uh, region does not look at China as a threat in the way that China is viewed in the South China Sea. India certainly does as a, as a problem, as a threat. Australia certainly does, but that's not necessarily true of a lot of the islands and, and a lot of the littoral nations. If they are thinking of China as a problem, it's because uh, to maintain their relationship with India. Um, there's also been issue of not looking at Indian Ocean region in the maritime domain as a key area is, for instance, in 2015, when India went to, uh, when the Indian prime minister went to Sri Lanka, it was the first time an Indian leader had gone to the island in 28 years. And the story is pretty similar across different countries and islands and littorals across the Indian Ocean region. Um, can you, sorry, am I stuck? Uh, it's not moving if that's what you're asking. Yeah, okay. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Sorry. yes, yes. I'll, I'll stop sharing this for now. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Um, so anyway, uh, China is not necessarily the new player in terms of a lot of the countries and littorals in the Indian Ocean region. It is It has been an old diplomatic and political partner for many, but I think where we're seeing more movements is on the military and defense side of it, whether it's in training with a lot of the African military uh, personnel, whether it's in terms of supplying uh, defense arms, submarines, or even, of course, deployments of submarines. What we have not seen so far is a deployment of an aircraft carrier, but I think it's in the horizon. Uh, the shipping lane that I did show has a lot of the ships and, and oil and energy that transits. It's for, for China. I think 80% of China's uh, energy is transits the Indian Ocean region. So from a point of view of being a maritime power and in its ability to secure its own slots and choke points, it would have to be in the Indian Ocean region. But again, keeping in mind that China's um, advantages are not in the Indian Ocean region, it's in the South China Sea. It actually has more vulnerabilities on the Indian Ocean region compared to India and its partners. But the but the but I think the difference this time in terms of a maritime competition be, between different players, or even in terms of naval competition or or bigger powers, is the is the other aspect of my work, which is um, the role 
of islands and how they shape it because of where they're situated geographically and because today they are sovereign nations. And they, um, as opposed to during the Cold War period or even, uh, and of course before that, where their choices were made by the colonial powers, but today they can choose to interact and have agreements with whoever they want. And that will have an impact on how their bigger neighbors uh, feel, react or, or um, view their own strategic uh, national security interests. Um, I think I've gone over time, my time, so I'll stop here and look forward to sharing more during Q&A. Thanks so much, Tarshana. Um, so we've gone from the neighborhood to the regional, uh, which sets us up very nicely for hear from Isaac Carden, who is going to talk about the global aspect of China's outbound activities. Thank you. James, and what a treat to join uh, esteemed colleagues, uh, Darshana and Andrew uh, benefited a lot and learned a lot from their presentations and really appreciate the invitation uh, from Nargis as well as James. Um, I'll try and compliment their very dynamic maps and deeply empirical presentations. Uh, I, I actually have some static maps, but I'm going to hopefully offer some dynamic ideas that will link China's maritime interests or rights and interests that Andrew talked about and the Indian Ocean environment that Darshana uh, helped us understand better and try and link some of that together um, a little bit more conceptually in terms of the way China uh, approaches the Indian Ocean region and beyond. Um, and so I think the framing of the this Davis series program is really helpful for bridging us uh, three maritime scholars in our interests. You're asking, and I'm quoting here, for, about China's adaptive understanding of sovereignty and territory and how they interact with its growing assertiveness in foreign affairs. And so we see what that looks like in the South China Sea, see what that looks like in the Indian Ocean. Um, and this kind of framing actually really nicely bridges my interest from my book on China's law of the sea that James kindly mentioned, as well as the international security piece that Wendy Loitert from Indiana University and I published recently looking at China's global port power. Uh, or rather the position in the global port network and how that uh, accrues to China's power. And I'll talk a little bit briefly about some of the findings from that study. But before I do, I hope you'll indulge me to just try and fit that into this broader discussion. And to me, the really key point of overlap here with a kind of policy hook on it, with an implication for China's foreign policy specifically, is this idea that China must now protect its overseas interests. We hear a lot uh, in both Andrew's work as well as my own and others it, working on the near seas areas about China's maritime rights and interests. What we have is their overseas analog. There's some very interesting connections to, to Chinese sovereignty, which I take to be the core principle and concept uh, at, at place here. But the way that the Chinese white papers discussing pro protecting overseas interests define them is quite revealing. Those overseas interests are generally grouped as Chinese citizens, of course, uh, but Chinese assets and investments and other types of presence. And then most importantly, from my perspective as a maritime scholar, it's the lines of communication between those citizens, those assets, those commercial transactions, those resources, those markets, and the Chinese homeland uh, and Chinese markets, which are predominantly on the uh, the East Asian littoral and thus require transits across vast maritime space. Uh, here, we're sort of looking west from China, and that's where we focus in our study on, on ports as well. Uh, and let me see if I can pull a slide just to show you the, unfortunately, static distribution here. Please uh, let me know if you can't see it. Uh, so what we're trying to... Uh, map out, as it were, here is China's presence in port terminals worldwide. Each of those points represents at least one terminal which a Chinese firm owns and or operates a, a facility, has a, has a concession or a lease to operate and usually owns some equity. Paper goes into a lot of detail on this, uh, but there are a couple of things from this piece that I think uh, dovetail really nicely with what we've heard about China and its near seas and its assertiveness from Andrew and about the, the complex geostrategic picture across the Indian Ocean region. Um, basically, one of the, the core arguments that Wendy and I try to make in our international security piece is that 
China's presence in, in commercial ports worldwide, and here we see mapped out the 95 different ports around the globe where a Chinese firm, again, has at least one terminal uh, under its ownership or, or in an operational role, um, that this position provides a platform for China's power projection. And, and But it's a type of power projection that we're not indexing properly. It is not, these are not military bases. Please do not look at this map and infer that. Uh, and I should add that this map, as I show in the source, was, was made in color by the folks at the Financial Times. I'll show you next some of our black and white maps uh, under different publishing circumstances at, at international security. Uh, but basically what this map is, uh, helping us to, to start to conceptualize is the, is the geographic scope of China's overseas interests and specifically that aspect of those interests that is connecting them, connecting these nodes to the Chinese mainland. And you can, this is not nearly as, as dynamic and interesting and, and, and frankly vivid and aesthetically pleasing a map as Darshan is, but I do think that the configuration of the shipping lines and the ports should tell you a couple things. Uh, and we go to some length to describe what those things are in the piece, but I'll flag a few just for our discussion. This is a largely commercial network. The activities of these ports, 99.9% .9 of the time, are likely to be commercial primarily in nature. We've tracked empirically the PLA Navy's extensive use of this network. At least a third of these ports have been called on, and they're used in increasingly intensive ways, more sophisticated purposes. But ultimately, that's a small portion of the use. What this broader commercial phenomenon is, what this power position in global ports is, is from a military standpoint, at least, is it provides a potent logistics and intelligence uh, network, not just individual hubs, but really conceptualizing as a network that allows China to sustain certain missions, are, I said, protect its overseas interests. That is the core mission that has trickled its way down to the PLA in its capacity as the, the main security guarantor for the Chinese party state and its citizens abroad. Um, the Let's see if I can flip through a slide here. Hope we can see this uh, black and white again, much more static, much less uh, aesthetically pleasing, but I hope illustrative map from the international security piece that I've been mentioning, which shows that there's a in addition to having a, a particular military function, which is, again is a, is a secondary or tertiary one, we can talk about, happy to, the, the various commercial and political phenomena associated with it. But the second thing that I want to point out is that there's a real geographic concentration of Chinese interest in ports and in related maritime transport infrastructure. And I would argue in the concentrations of its overseas interests fundamentally across the Indian Ocean region. This uh, crudely drawn sea line of communication here rather a, a, a bunch of different highly trafficked routes that commercial as well as naval and any other shipping that wants to travel between East Asia and the Middle East or Africa or Europe is going to track. This is often referred to both in China's strategic community as well as in industry uh, as a maritime lifeline. Uh, and that's because, as, as Darshana mentioned, something on the order of 80% of China's imported oil flows across this route. About half of that, or more than half of that, rather, is coming out of the Gulf. About half of China's overall imported oil is from the Gulf. Uh, and of course, China's biggest export markets are up in the northwestern part of this map, moving up into the Med. Its biggest mineral uh, import, excuse me, exports from Africa, uh, min minerals as well as oil and gas, are by far the biggest quantities traveling to China. And so this lifeline, this sea line of communication really conveys the necessary and essential elements of China's national well-being, its basic economic system, much less its high-end power projection. And so just that's sort of a key uh, distinction with a difference that we draw is that while there are dual-use capabilities that China is extracting from this network of ports, they are by and large not this high-end combat potential. This is not a posture that would put China in a good position militarily, operationally, to say, fight a major campaign in the Persian Gulf or in the Northern Indian Ocean for that matter. Uh, of course, they have more capability to do something like that than they used to, and they will continue to grow in that regard. That's not uh, a, a, a slippery slope I necessarily want to walk down, but what I will say is that what's very notable about this network is how much it is, the leading edge of it is economic. It's China's economic power, its capacity to build, own, operate, and use this huge maritime network that 
provides for its essential uh, livelihood at home as well as its strategic uh, security and stability abroad. Uh, so with that, uh, I will turn it back to our host and hopefully have a discussion with uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Isaac. Uh, there we go. Um, this has been a, a fantastic set of uh, points that all three of you have raised. Um, I wanted to pick up on something before we turn it over to the audience, uh, which is what Isaac just mentioned, but I think, <clears throat> excuse me, pertains to all three of these talks, which is how much of what we're observing in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean is really a function of China's increased capacity rather than necessarily a completely new concept of sovereignty. Um, and I'm thinking back here to, you know, about 10 years ago, uh, the discussion was China doesn't really have a blue water navy. It's very much uh, focused on its neighborhood, and that's all it really cares about. And we're seeing that sort of develop over time. Um, but how much of it is sort of a very practical question um, about capacity more than anything? And Isaac, maybe we start with you. Thanks. James, and this was not pre-planned, but I think that's a great way actually to knit together a discussion that Andrew uh, Chubb and I have been having for many years uh, when he was working on this international security piece that I think really is the the sort of state of the art in understanding China's assertiveness in, uh, in its near season, the South China Sea specifically. Um, I asked him in, in my capacity as a reviewer, uh, or rather as part of the same postdoc program, about whether or not we could tell this story as just being a function of China's growing capacity. And in the South China Sea, what we're talking about there is things like maritime law enforcement vessels and trained personnel for them, it's capacity to deploy a billion dollar deep sea oil rig and plant it in what Vietnam claims is its EEZ, capacity to put a satellite link on a huge volume of, of fishing vessels and, and loosely test them to do various things. All those things are kind of fundamentally, even if you have an interest in it, even if you have a particular conception of sovereignty, as, as James is, is pointing us towards, without the necessary capacity, it's just a, it's an empty gesture at best. And we saw some of the rhetoric, and I think it is worth trying to piece together, and I do do this in my book, trying to understand whether or not China's claims, its actual maritime rights that it is asking for and its interests are in fact changing over time. And by and large, the answer is really no. And I think the capacity story is quite important. As we move out of the near seas and into the Indian Ocean in particular, but I'd say also across the Pacific, I think China's that that capacity, the, the density of it attenuates very quickly. So I don't know that I see that kind of growing capacity being quite the same story there, other than to say China's scale, especially when I'm looking at maritime transport, is such that even if there's no intent for them to create a strategic challenge to the United States or to others, it effectively does. So that's, I guess, sort of the capacity story. Because China has such a strong position in maritime transport, because by certain ways of measuring it, basically something on the order of 60 or 70% of maritime trade has some kind of China nexus, whether it's flowing through Chinese ports or it's produced in Chinese, uh, some part of the, the verticals of their supply chains. China is the world leader, not just in ports, but also in shipping and in cranes. We just had some exciting reporting in the Wall Street Journal today. Uh, and uh, in insuring ships and building and leasing and operating shipping vessels, as well as the ports, as well as the rail, as well as the roads, as well as all the, the services and digital tech with it. And that capacity, that growing scale and size and in industry, I think, puts everybody in, an, in a position where they have to negotiate with China for their own economic well-being. And that is kind of the key security problem that I think we're facing. And that's when questions about, well, what's the extent of China's sovereignty over its individuals and what they say in foreign jurisdictions or what they do? Uh, and of course, the national security law in Hong Kong is one of the most chilling examples of how extensive that vision could be. Uh, but I guess just the last thing to say, and hopefully not an alarmist one, is that China's ideas about sovereignty are very, very conservative in some ways small c conservative. They're very attached to this territorial principle. We see that very strongly in the maritime domain. It's one of the reasons that it's such a struggle there, I would hazard, and I'm curious how the others react. It's because once you get outside of a territorial sea, 
you don't have full sovereignty anymore, but you do have jurisdiction. You do have sovereign rights. And this is created. That's one of the reasons I think for China, this has been such a problematic area and will continue to be. And I don't know that they necessarily have those issues overseas, but maybe some of that is starting to evolve. So I'm curious what, what others think about it. Thanks. Yeah, Andrew and Darshana, would you like to respond? Yeah, sure. I think, um, like I said, I think um, at least in the Indian Ocean region, perhaps in terms of it's definitely a show of I, I, what Isaac mentioned in terms of scale and capacity, right? Because it's, again, it's not something that they have, they started going into the region after they were able to establish XYZ in the South China Sea or able to gain, you know, a particular standard. They had been there from before, whether you look at politically or diplomatically or through visits. I mean, um, the Chinese foreign minister was in Comoros a couple of months ago. Can you think of any other leader who's been to that island country in the in recent memory? You know, so so they have been there. They have been there in terms of high level visits, in terms of being there, in terms of again embassies. So I think, I think the intention perhaps was there, or they didn't understand. Again, it goes back to the to the concept of how much of trade is dependent on the region, how much of energy is being imported from the region, but also if you are deploying whether it's in terms of diplomatic, whether it's in terms of pure trade, whether it's in terms of investments to Africa, to Middle East, to South Asia, which includes Bangladesh and Sri Lanka and, and UAE and Kenya and Mozambique, you have to transit the Indian Ocean region, right? It's not just about the Straits of Malacca. You have to go all the way to Africa. You have to go all the way to the Middle East and you have to transit the Indian Ocean region. The first time they deployed their submarines to the Indian Ocean region was in support for the anti-piracy missions. You don't necessarily need a submarine for anti-piracy emissions, but that was, you know, I think it's been it's been built on foundational work they did do, which may not have been as aggressive and as um, as often as we see it now, especially after the Belt and Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road. But I do think it goes somewhere to the concept of sort of somewhere to the question of their capacity being increasing, whether it's purely from the point of view of trade or purely from the point of view of investment. And the other thing that that I do want to make a point is, you know, a lot of the conversation does revolve around which which feels like, in, in especially here in DC, which is, you know, that China has gone to XYZ country and, uh, you know, made all this investment so that it can have strategic implications. It 100% has strategic implications. I don't think that China has ever downplayed its uh, goals to be a maritime power or a maritime nation but uh, it was also because of a because it was filling a vacuum right if India as its largest security neighbor to Sri Lanka did not go to the island for 28 years old 20, 28 years that's not necessarily on Beijing to leave that gap unfulfilled right like and the same thing happened in the Middle East and same thing happened in Africa where I think a lack of a direct competition in the Indian Ocean did create this vacuum and greater power, uh, traditional players got complacent in their foreign policy engagements in that region. And I think China has built on it. So countries have welcomed it. Um, and that welcome, and they've been able to fill that in through the growth in the capacity, primarily through trade, which is not a very different story when you think about all of the ways pre-colonial, I guess, or, or pre-1945, when you think about how navies came into the region. And if I could just add, uh, James, that question that you've put there uh, is really a time-honoured question about capabilities versus ideas or concepts. Uh, it's a sort of question we ask all the time about any state, uh, really, but particularly in relation to China, which has a number of very interesting ideas when it comes to the maritime domain, as Isaac's book very ably lays out. Um, in terms of this, so we always have to we always have to ask this question about the specific behaviors and policies that we're seeking to explain. Um, I think in terms of the South China Sea, uh, a general, a relative comprehensive national power, if you like, based on uh, relative military capabilities, uh, is a necessary but insufficient uh, element of China's uh, about a factor in, in China's behaviors. Uh, I think it certainly explains some things, uh, some very prominent things, including the island building campaign, which is something that was talked about for a number of years, 
uh, back into the 2000s, um, but uh, was not something that was really available to Xi Jinping's predecessors. So that's a good example of where something that might appear to be Xi Jinping's more aggressive, or more forward-leaning policy uh, very likely is something that uh, if Xi Jinping's predecessors has had those capabilities at their disposal, they may well have used them in a similar way. Um, uh, on the other hand, that general national power, uh, military and economic, uh, these sort of generalized measures of, of national capability, uh, I don't think are very good at explaining the, 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 the shift in China's behavior from 2007 that I mentioned before. Um, China had relative uh, military advantages, over pretty overwhelming relative military advantages over its Southeast Asian neighbors in the South China Sea from the early 2000s. And it's certainly from 2001, 2002, when the US becomes distracted by the wars in the Middle East uh, and enlists China into its global war on terror. Uh, but we didn't see the shift then. We saw the shift five, six years later. So what I argue is uh, uh, sort of uh, closer to a sufficient explanation uh, concerns the specific capabilities that China needed in order to do what it did. Uh, some of the things that Isaac mentioned before, maritime law enforcement vessels, uh, uh, large uh, sort of logistical uh, uh, supply bases in order to keep um, units in this far-flung disputed area, hostile geography um, uh, supplied, uh, those types of things. Um, and those, very interestingly, going circling back to the, the second part of your question about intentionality or concepts, ideas, um, those require those types of capabilities, the specific capabilities that explain why China was able to do what it could do, often have a long lead-in time, which in turn implies that the intentionality actually lies further back in time than we are that we, that it might appear on the surface. Um, things like the large uh, dredging capacity, something that China would be building up for for a long time. Um, the maritime law enforcement capabilities that I mentioned before uh, really go back to the late 1990s when China first made those allocations of resources to build that 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 Great White Fleet. Um, so uh, so so the oftentimes the ideas actually matter at a different time than what it might appear on the surface. Okay, um, th thank you very much. Uh, let me do uh, the, the next round of questions. Um, we received a question for Andrew, to what extent the uh, China's assertiveness on the sea uh, is linked to the uh, territorial disputes on land. And I want to add, um, let me let me ask all the questions right away to all the panelists so then then we can go into the uh, to the answers. Um, we as part of this series, we did uh, an event on peace fiber optic cable um, built by a China led uh, consortium connecting South Asia with uh, uh, with uh, East Africa. And uh, Tia wanted to ask you whether, apart from ports, choke points, and, you know, all these all these things we've discussed, we also need to think about the uh, the cables. Uh, the, you know, the, this network of cables is growing and they're becoming more and more stra stra strategically important. So what's your, uh, what's your thinking on that? Um, um, and they're built in South Southeast China Sea and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's one question. Maybe I can ask it to uh, to maybe I can ask you, Isaac, uh, to to share your thoughts. Um, and uh, and the question to you, Darshana, I, I thought it was very interesting what what you said about the uh, rules based order and how um, nations uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, they see um, Western countries as you know, breaching this rules-based order. Uh, you mentioned France, US, and UK, and the um, the case of Diego Garcia. Well, in the in the hearing, I I read your I read your uh, testimony prior prior to the to the event, which is very interesting because he in the West, of course. Um, you know, we see, although I shouldn't say that I'm Central Asian, but the West sees itself as the pillar kind of the, of, of the rules-based order. And that's not exactly how smaller states uh, see the situation, right? Uh, but at the same time, smaller states are more interested in rules-based 
best order. Uh, uh, and um, kind of my question is, do, do, do you see this kind of increasing interest of small estates in rules-based order? Uh, and uh, maybe kind of in South, uh, South China Sea, Southeast China Sea, the kind of more emphasis on rules-based order from the sm smaller, smaller states in response to this growing assertiveness uh, of China. Let me, let me start with, uh, yeah, uh, with you, Andrew. Yeah, thanks, Nuggies. Um, that's a great question, uh, whether China sort of uh, pushes on one dispute while easing back on another. I, I think the reason it's a really good question is the evidence is really mixed. Um, I sort of came of age as a South China Sea watcher, just as the East China Sea was very conspicuously also heating up between 2010 and 2012, um, which really sort of raised this, this question. A lot of people uh, were uh, sort of searching for explanations for why China would sort of so stupidly push on against so many uh, adversaries at the same time. Um, likewise, in 2020, um, when they sort of ramped things up on the Sino-Indian border on the land side, going to your question more directly, uh, there was no sign of an easing back in the maritime domain. Um, and so I, I don't have a good explanation for that pattern. Um, I'd be very interested in my fellow panelists and even your own um, takes on that. Um, but I'll just mention that, you know, this is a classic argument back in the 1960s and 70s by the great analyst Alan Whiting, uh, who uh, wrote about what he called the Chinese calculus of deterrence which featured this idea that, you know, if you, 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 you basically, it is rational, it's not stupid and sort of self-encircling and self-defeating uh, to push on all fronts at the same time, because your enemies are observing what each other is doing, and they are basically forming a, uh, a hostile, generalized sort of hostile force. And so you need to actually push on all fronts at the same time in order to deter other enemies from becoming emboldened and becoming part of a implicit conspiracy to encircle China. Um, so that's that's an argument that's been going on for a number of decades, uh, and I think it's still going on because because you can you can you can find evidence to to uh, support or refute the idea that that's what's going on um, in Beijing at the moment in terms of their thinking. Thank, thank you, Andrew. Isaac, can we go to you or sure. you want to delegate? Sure. I'm, I'm happy to jump in. And there's so much, so many rich comments from everyone on the table here. I'll, I'll try and focus down to the question about submarine cables in particular. But I just wanted to take the chance to violently agree with Andrew. I don't think it's just a capabilities story. Obviously, the intention underlies it in some, some deeply fundamental way. Uh, but there's also sort of, I guess, another explanation we could throw on there is that there's even less intentionality to some of the, the effects of scale, like thinking about dredging capability. And from my perspective now, when I look out at the global market for dredging out new harbors, China's the only one bidding on a lot of projects. They bid much lower. They threw that at the South China Sea. They'll throw it at other things. Some part of it is just this emergent property of a maritime Maritime power in China's conception is much more commercially focused. And it's like, this is what they mean. You're going to dominate all these commercial spaces, whether, whether you intend to or not, and whether other states like it or not. And so I think the submarine question is another one of those. It's just China has this huge scale and capacity and interest strategically as well as economically and, and, uh, and access across the globe. And so submarine cables, I have noted in my research, are very often co-located with port facilities that China has built. They are often part of these package deals that Chinese officials, along with heads of state-owned enterprises and other firms, basically show up and market to individual leaders, uh, regions. I think the you know the China's engagement with the Gulf states and its engagement with uh, with FOCAC, the African. Uh, groups, all of these kind of have this these vertically integrated conceptions of 
the big value proposition that China adds, its big strategic, its most competitive strategic instrument, in my view, if we're talking about strategic competition, is of course the, the scale of its economic enterprise, its markets, its demand, especially for, for raw materials. And I think the cables come as part and parcel of that. I've spent a lot of time studying, doing case studies on Djibouti and uh, Gwadar in Pakistan. And it is not coincidental that there's a submarine cable built by Huawei submarine that goes that way. On the West Coast of Africa, similarly, a bunch of port projects, and they are the ones connecting those. And it's because China's interests concentrate together. They float together. And ultimately, I think it creates a type of very integrated uh, maritime power that's not naval power per se, but that's quite consequential, has quite uh, can be can be delivered with great impact to host governments who want to say, hey, China, we heard from the United States that this is no good. Would you like to make us a <laughs> counteroffer? And what the counteroffer from them is, we'll just do it next door and you're the ones who are going to miss out. And so it's a very powerful type of type of instrument. And it, and it uh, yeah, I think that the sovereignty implications, I'll, I'll leave to my more uh, sophisticated colleagues. Thanks. Darshan, if you want to add on this, you're also most welcome on this, on the, the, the earlier question. And uh, if you could address the question I asked to you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is definitely a very fascinating conversation. I can, I think you can see the three of us are very invested in every aspect of this, the, these, these elements of, I guess, maritime security and competition. Um, I don't have much to add on to the sovereignty uh, question in terms of the certain depths, but but I think I think we'll we'll start seeing some aspects of it in the Indian Ocean as well. It's not going to be completely removed and a separate story in the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean region. But I think the metrics of measurement will be different in the Indian Ocean because there's no sovereign issue or disputes. Like I said, we map the entire Indian Ocean for disputes in the Indian Ocean region. Guess who doesn't have a single dispute? China. So, you know, that's going to be a separate question, but I think on the issue of assertiveness, how it comes across, I think Andrew made the point, I'm not sure Isaac, that, you know, the more you have your people in the region, the more you need to invest and be present there. So I think we'll see more deployments and how, what that, what that translates to, for instance, submarines for anti-piracy missions, scale response of it isn't really necessary. So what do you need to be able to protect your submarine cables, I think those are some of the metrics and the parameters that will that will change and will be interesting in the in the Indian Ocean region. Um, on the question of the sort of the small states and rule space and national order, I think I think like you like you very correctly said that small states are very invested in in having a rule space international order because they think the United Nations, they think a written out clear policy on, on sort of rules and norms and law protects them because a lot of the countries are much smaller. You know, they don't necessarily have the military to, to the scale and the size of the bigger, bigger countries. So they're very much invested in that. And you would see from a UN voting record, they'll never be absent on issues of, you know, global importance that has, whether it's on the Ukraine war or anything even before in terms of, Voting. So I think that track record has been really good. But the question is more about when you say rules based in national order, I, I guess the question from them is um, who's rule in which order, right? So it's we, so the thing, so the concession consensus is that there should be rules and there should be order, but are we still going to accept the rules that was decided immediately after the 19, after 1945 at a, in an era where a lot of them were still colonies or just emerging out of you know colonial rule after? centuries and hundreds of years or or will you be willing to have more of that conversation to make that adjustment and i don't think so that's specific to just small states either i mean germany japan and india has a, has been asking for uh, you know changing the un security council right so it's it's very much a conversation of who was sitting at the table after 1945 writing writing the story and who all were left behind in the conversation and the question is today, a lot of the global South, including the smaller island states, were not there at the table at that point in time. Uh, many of the countries gained their independence in the 70s, late 60s and 70s. So you're well into the thick of the Cold War by the time they became an independent country for the first time. So I think on the rules based and national order, um, they do question in terms of that, I, I guess the the challenge is that if if the Western countries are only going to talk to littorals and smaller islands in the region and say that 
we are a better champion of democracy and you know or or upholding rules and norms and china is not it's not completely disagreed but i think it falls flat somewhere because the track record has not necessarily been you know what we tend to think i think in the west but having said that there's of course i think the united states or others who 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 have who certainly have a better track record in terms of implementing treaties and rules and norms even if when they're not signed on to it like unclos the us is not has not ratified and it's something that china brings up over and over again but when you're going to a smaller state and you're saying that you know we should protect the rules and norms the established order because when you don't protect us and when you don't support us it's going to all fall apart and you know china is challenging that the first thing that comes out well you don't even you haven't even ratified to the only treaty that is sort of you know governing the <laughs> the laws of the sea but then but but if you actually go down and do do a assessment of does the united states adhere to the norms of unclos yes it absolutely does and you might you will also feel you will also say china has a treaty to it as is is has ratified it but might not always adhere to it in the same sense so i think that conversation somewhere has to change there has to be adjustments made and if the us i'm glad finally uk is going to the table to negotiate with mauritius on the chagos issue it was um i think they pushed it around for a long time and it will have absolute military and strategic implications but i think it's it really is a big step in terms of having conversations that have emerged from the period of decolonization or even you know from periods of uh, independence and smaller states truly watch this very closely because you know there's a lot of small states they don't have bilateral ties or embassies to the united states like in dc they will have missions at the un so they put forward all their energy and resources into multilateral systems because they think that's what it'll protect them so rules based order is absolutely important but which rules and whose order well that's an excellent way to end this really excellent uh, fantastic conversation um well, a little bit over time, uh, but uh, but let me spend a minute uh, thanking thanking everybody. Um, thank you very much, uh, our wonderful speakers, um, Andrew, Darshana, Isaac, and um, I want to thank um, Fairbank Center and the Davis Center for helping us run this series. Uh, I want to thank the audiences for tuning in, and um, Laura Sarjan who um, who helped us. With the logistics of this event. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank J James uh, for, for being my partner in crime. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>